Welcome back everyone. Today we're gonna to talk about how to combine concrete with steel to make reinforced concrete structures. To start off, let's talk about some of the properties of concrete and steel and why these make such a good combination. So let's look at the concrete first. If I put my concrete into compression, I'll get the following stress strain diagram right here. And we can see that there's effectively two branches. There's the pre-peak and post-peak behavior where my peak is happening at a stress of F prime C. That's the compressive strength of my concrete. Now, prior to the compressive strength, we have a linear region that goes up to roughly 40% of F prime C and then a non-linear region right here. And then after the peak, this is behavior known as softening where my stress is actually decreasing with increasing strain and it will fail at an ultimate strain known as the crushing strain right here. Now this ultimate strain, if we look in, for example, ACI 318.19, is defined at a strain of 0.003. Now that can vary a little bit depending on your concrete, but it's a pretty good ballpark number for virtually all forms of concrete. Now on the flip side, if I take this thing and I put it into tension, we don't really get this sort of behavior at all. As you've probably noticed, concrete intention will crack and the strength of concrete intention is roughly about one tenth of its compressive strength. So for most design purposes, we neglect that and say intention, it's cracked and ineffective. Now the steel will step in and take that part of my stress. So if I look at steel, steel is very effective in both compression and tension, but we're primarily going to be use it, using it to carry our tensile stresses in our reinforced concrete structure. Now in typical American practice, we'll be using grade 60 steel, which has a yield stress of 60 KSI. However, higher stress steels are becoming more common in practice. You'll notice that this steel has a very definitive yield point and that stress we'll call FY there's a plateau and then there is a strain hardening region contrasted with higher stress steels that often just have a roundhouse type curve, not a definitive yield plateau. And then it continues to harden up until ultimate fracture. Now, one of the main advantages of steel that we're going to take advantage of in our reinforced concrete structure is the fact that steel is highly ductile, which means that it can sustain a very large strain after it hits its yield way back here. And that will give our concrete structure the necessary ductility to make it a desirable building material. So now let's talk about how we can combine concrete and steel to make an effective structure. In our case, let's look at a beam. So looking at this beam, we have a distributed load W along the whole length. Let's draw the shear and moment diagrams for the structure. So my shear diagram is just going to be a line across the entire width with the maximum shear being at the two ends. And then if I draw a moment diagram, it's going to be the classic parabola where my peak moment is 1 8th WL squared. But the key feature is that we have our maximum moment here at mid span. Now under this load, this structure is going to deflect downwards, which is putting my top in compression and then my bottom in tension. Now let's ignore the effects of steel for right now. If we just think about the concrete, tension on the bottom means we're going to be cracking that concrete on the bottom of my section just like this. Now that's gonna be a problem. I'm not really gonna have the tensile capacity to carry this moment without some steel. So let's add some steel. I'm gonna add some steel bars in the bottom of my section. And if I draw out my little cross section here, we'll have, for example, two steel bars right down there. And that bridges my crack and it's going to be carrying that tensile stress in the bottom, whereas the concrete will be carrying the compressive stresses in the top of the beam. Now, if we look at shear, we have the maximum shear at the two ends. And if I pull out a little section right here, we'll notice that my principal stresses are going to be oriented on this 45 degree angle where I have my principal tension going in this direction right here for that end. And then my principal compression will be acting along the opposite diagonal there. Now that means effectively my concrete is being pulled apart in this direction here. And if we look on the opposite end of the beam, it's gonna be pulled apart in this diagonal direction in the other way. So if we see cracking on the ends, we'll see cracking kind of at this angle here. Now my steel at the bottom of my section might not be effective at intercepting those cracks. So then we install a different type of steel and this is known as transverse reinforcement. So if I put some transverse reinforcement around the ends, of my beam here, 
that transverse reinforcement usually takes the form of a stirrup. So we'll put stirrups in our section. And a stirrup could, for example, look something like this, where it's going around the circumference of my section and these vertical legs are going to help intercept the cracks that are happening because of shear. So that's going to be the main idea of how we use reinforcement in concrete. Let's take one last look at the overall behavior of a concrete beam as it's loaded from start to finish. We're gonna use the moment curvature plot to describe our reinforced concrete's beam behavior from zero load up until failure. So at first, this beam starts uncracked. So I'm gonna draw a dotted line here that describes our uncracked section. And while this is uncracked, it's going to follow just traditional beam theory. So our moment is equal to our modulus E times the moment of inertia I times the curvature. Now the E that we're using here is the modulus of our concrete. So we'll call that E sub C and the I moment of inertia is I gross. So that's I sub G and that describes the moment of inertia of an uncracked section. Now, obviously this section is going to crack. So as I increase my load at some point, my tensile stress in my concrete will hit my modulus of rupture, which is effectively the cracking stress of concrete. So at this point I crack and now I'm going to transition to a new curve with a shallower slope. So we'll draw a second curve right here. And this is going to be my cracked curve here. Now along the cracked curve, it still follows linear behavior. So we'll still have our moment is equal to E times I times the curvature. E is still the modulus of our concrete that's unchanged, but we're going to be using the cracked moment of inertia for our section. And because we have cracks, the cracked moment of inertia is always less than the gross or uncracked moment of inertia. So as we increase the moment, as the crack progresses, we'll transition over to our cracked moment of inertia section. And then at some point, we're going to have yielding of our steel. Now that I've yielded my steel, I hit the yield plateau for my reinforced concrete beam. So here we have a very small increase in moment, but a very large increase in curvature. And our ultimate failure here is going to occur when our concrete crushes. And that is again at a strain of roughly 0.003. So the failure condition is not defined by the stress in my concrete, but actually the strain in my concrete when that reaches the crushing strain. Now again, this yield plateau is only possible because of the yielding of our reinforcement. So we can see that these two materials work very well together in that the reinforcement makes my brittle concrete into an effectively ductile structure, which is very desirable for structural engineering. And that wraps up our brief introduction to reinforced concrete structures. Stay tuned for future videos where we'll talk about when does cracking happen? When do we yield? And when does failure occur? And how do I calculate that capacity? So as always, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.